Good to hear the singing. Good to hear the Bible quoting. Praise the Lord. Now it's preaching time. Is that okay, Lord? <laughs> Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. A good bit of what we say this evening will be repetition from what we said on Sunday evening. We'll come at this from just a little bit different angle, but we really want to reinforce this truth. It's one of the, one of the foundational truths upon which uh, my, our Bible Baptist Deland teaching ministry is founded, and that is that all of the Scripture exalts and magnifies Jesus Christ and therefore all of the scripture is vitally important to, to God's people and to Christians and, and you wouldn't think that would be a, a, a controversial thing but uh, so many uh, groups, people, denominations, churches seem to focus on one truth or one portion of the Bible or one uh, way, uh, uh, one, one uh, doctrine they want to emphasize and I have always believed and, and hope I'll believe until the Lord takes me out of this world. If you are emphasizing anything other than Jesus Christ, you're out of balance. You're out of balance. If you're emphasizing a bus ministry or soul winning or a youth program or a music program, or, or it, it might be a good thing. But it's nothing in comparison with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we want him to be the, the main one, the focal point of, of, of everything. And, and if you, if you uh, say, make another statement, then we'll, we'll pray together. You cannot rightly interpret anything in the Bible without everything in the Bible. And almost all false teaching in our churches is taken out of the Bible. You couldn't teach it if it was left in the Bible the way it's taught. If you leave something in, in the, the immediate passage, then the chapter, then the book, then the testament, then the Bible as a whole, the entire Bible has to support what you're teaching and there can't be anything in the Bible that contradicts what you're teaching and if you haven't searched it out, start to finish, front to back, uh, end, middle, both sides, uh, you, you, you're not ready to teach it. I've done so many Bible studies, I had a thought, an idea from a verse or a passage and I thought th this is going to be really good, really interesting, and, uh, but let's run all the references and check all the verses and maybe out of 20 references, one doesn't support the theory, and then it's just a theory. You've got to throw it out. You've got to make sure that, that uh, what you're teaching is, uh, is not going to create contradictions within the Bible. There are no contradictions in the Bible, but oftentimes people create contradictions by the way that they handle God's Word. So, Father, help us tonight, please, to glory in the Word that you've given us and to take what we can from it tonight. Little by little, little by little, week after week after week, you, you change our hearts and our minds and you conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, not all at once, but one day we look up and, and we're more like Jesus than we are like, our, like the old man. And we, we just pray, God, you'd help us toward that end tonight. In Jesus' name, and amen. All right, Romans 15 and verse number 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that would be the, before the writing of the New Testament epistles. So that would be a reference to what we call the Old Testament scriptures. What things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So when, he's, when, when the Holy Spirit is writing this letter to saved Christians in a New Testament church, he says, I wrote the Old Testament so you could learn to be good Christians. So you cannot divorce the Old Testament from New Testament Christianity. You say, well, we, we follow the Apostle Paul. Good, follow him into the Old Testament. He just told you that it's all for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. There are doctrines set forth in the New Testament 
that are illustrated and, and pictured and worked out in the Old Testament. The New Testament, in, in repeating one of the Ten Commandments, tells us, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And yet as I read Matthew through Revelation, I don't read a single story or account of someone who committed adultery and paid a high price for it. So if all, all I did is take a, a verse from the New Testament and say adultery is a sin, that ought to be enough. But how much more force does it carry if I can take you back into the life of David and show you a man who committed adultery and what it cost him in his life and in his career and in his family and in his children and how many trips he made to the cemetery and how, how that blot remains upon his name to this day. And so I have, a, I have a commandment in the New Testament, but I have the teaching in the Old Testament that, that supports and strengthens and empowers that commandment. Just, just for, for one example. But I want you to look with me in Romans chapter 15, where, where we are. And I, I want you, first of all, to, to just for a minute, put yourself in this position and say, I only, I only go by what is written by Paul. I, 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 don't, I don't pay any attention to the rest of the Bible. I just go by what, what Paul wrote. Okay, look at chapter 15 and verse number 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, as it is written, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. How can I say I'm following Paul when the example of Paul is I went to the Old Testament writings to learn what I know and am preaching about Jesus Christ? It's not like there's no doctrine of Christ until Paul comes along and either invents it as the, as the secular writers would say or is given it by revelation as the conservative writers would say. His doctrine of Jesus Christ he found in the Old Testament and brought forward in the New and said, this is what God said about a coming Messiah, a coming Savior, and I'm reaching back there and bringing this to you and saying, and Jesus Christ is the one of whom this scripture speaks. Look in verse number 8, same chapter. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now, with, with all due respect to those of you who are brand new Christians, suppose you had been saved five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you said, I'm only reading Paul, I'm not studying the Old Testament because it's not for the church. Then I ask you, what does he mean, the circumcision? Whose fathers? Who are the fathers? And what is it that pertained to one group of people that doesn't pertain to another group of people? You can't make any sense at all of Romans 15.8 if all you read is what Paul wrote. Paul's writings require that you have a working knowledge of the books that were written before Paul ever got saved. Look at verse number 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. The Apostle Paul is being directed by the Holy Spirit to write a chapter to the church and the bulk of that chapter consists of things the Holy Spirit already wrote to the Jews in the Old Testament. And he's not bringing them from the old to the new and changing their meaning. 
he's not bringing them from the old to the new and altering their truth he's reaching back in the old testament and saying god said he was going to do this and this is what god said he was going to do how do you divorce the two rightly dividing the word cannot be made to mean that you separate parts of the Bible from each other and, and you do not allow them to ever come together again. That, that can't be the meaning of that, of that instruction. Look at verse number, verse number 11. And again, or, or verse 10, again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Now, once again, suppose you, you, ha you don't have Genesis to Malachi. Somebody in your, in your dorm at, at college, somebody in your job said, here's a New Testament, read this. It'll tell you all you need to know about Jesus. Now if he said read this, it will tell you about Jesus, he's right. But it's not all you need to know about Jesus or God would have just written a New Testament. It's not all you need to know about Jesus. In fact, when I read verse 10, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Do you know that to this very hour, even independent Baptist churches dispute over who are his people? Yeah. Well, how would, you, how would you know who his people are? If you read Genesis, you would know who his people are. If you read Exodus, you would know who his people are. If you read Ezekiel, you would know who his people are. There is a, there is a requirement not to get saved. You can get saved reading four verses out of Ephesians or three verses out of Romans or, or a handful of verses out of John. It's easy to get saved. But if you want to learn and understand the truth of the Word of God, you need the Old Testament. And there's so much of the New Testament that requires that you understand the Old Testament. Now there are those who say, and I, I know we covered this in Romans 9, 10, 11 in some detail, but there's those who say that Israel used to be, they used to be God's people. But God's all done with Israel, all through with Israel, and then he replaced Israel with the church. Fifteen chapters into Romans, the Holy Spirit says to the church... This is what I'm doing with the Gentiles, and this is what I'm doing with my people. The Gentiles never became the church, and God's people never became the church, and the church never became God's people, and the church never became Gentiles. And it sure helps to know from the Old Testament who God's people are. Verse number 11 and again, and again, praise ye the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. So verse 10, his people, verse 11, all ye people, but, but verse, uh, verse 9 is a, a quotation from the Old Testament, verse 10 is a quotation from the Old Testament, verse 11 is a quotation from the Old Testament, verse 12, and again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse. Now again, I, I'm, I'm not trying to belabor the point, but God's belaboring the point. Who's Jesse? He's not in Genesis, maybe in a genealogy, uh, he, he, or uh, Matthew, I mean, he, he may be in a genealogy of Matthew. He might be in a genealogy in Luke. He's not in Mark. He's not in John. If you got his name in a list of names, that's not sufficient. Who is this root of Jesse? Why does Jesse have a root? Why are we concerned with someone that came from someone named Jesse? And again, Isaiah saith, there should be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So Christians, I'm a Christian, you Christian? Yeah. I know the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah. The Gentiles, whole different operation, are going to be ruled over 
by a man who comes from Jesse, who's not a Gentile. And if you don't think there's going to be some changes made in this old world, the Gentiles are going to rejoice when a Jew rules over them. That'll be a big change. Now, you know what everything we've read so far requires? That you know more than the 27 books of the New Testament. Verse number 16, same chapter. All right, let's start at 15. Nevertheless, brethren... I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort is putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. And so let's just say it one more time. You need the Old Testament to understand who the Gentiles are. And how are they going to be offered up? And how will Gentiles ever be acceptable to God? So this chapter is a a great place to to illustrate and a great place to, to gain an understanding of the fact that all of this book is to be read by God's people. And all of this book is to be studied by God's people. And I, I realize, I realize it's a, it's a tough thing when you start in Genesis and try to read through that Bible and say there's so much in there that confuses me. There's so much in there I don't understand. I think I'll just read the New Testament because that's easier to understand. Well, some of it is, some of it isn't. I, I would say to you, I've been reading through the Bible, reading through the Bible, reading through the Bible, reading through the Bible for 40 plus years. I don't know that I have any more clarity on the order of those kings in, in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. I still get all twisted up when I try to put Ezra and Nehemiah together. And then when I try to take those prophets and overlay the prophets and, and with which king the prophet is, is living and who's, who's in what time. So I, I, And I say this respectfully. I'm not saying this like you know, the man of God up here in the in the lowly little church people down here. I'm saying if by the grace of God and your kindness, I get to spend my life studying the Bible, and there's a lot of it, I, it's not clear to me, why would you expect that it would be clear to you when you read it and what free time you have when you're not providing for your family? But the, the path to clarity is not to throw out 45 of 66 books or 50 of 66 books, it would be easier to understand if I just don't read all that, but it won't be. Because whatever part you're reading can't be clarified fully, properly, without the parts you're not reading. Need the whole Bible. Now, I said we're going to do some repetition. Uh, for three, three, three main points. The Old Testament scriptures are important in our, and, and here come, just go ahead guys, get ready, here come the flurry of comments. They're important for understanding salvation. John chapter 5, John chapter 5, John chapter 5. I've already said, I don't have everything figured out, but I'll tell you one thing I've figured out. The reason there's so much controversy about things taught in the Bible is because people put more stock in what some man wrote in a book than they do in what God wrote in the Bible. And they will cling to something they heard from a preacher at the expense of what the book actually says. Well, that's not what that means. We're... we're, We're not going down that road. Look at John chapter 5 and verse number 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. You've got to have two witnesses. If just Jesus said, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Savior of the world, that's not enough. You've got to have have a second witness. There is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. Okay? 
I want to read you John's witness. John says, you ready? Behold, the Lamb of God, which added to your works law-keeping and sacrifices, will take away the sin of the world. That's not what he said. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what he said. So, I, I'm going to agree with the witness of John, who said, before Calvary, to Jews under the law, that the Lamb of God taketh away the sin, not of the Jews, of the world, of the world, long before Paul shook off his resentment of a professed Messiah who would take away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, he said it's Jesus Christ. Okay, verse number 30, 33. Uh, ye sent unto John, he bear witness unto the truth, but I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his life. Now, you know what Jesus just said? John told you how to get saved. And John didn't say, behold the water which take away the sins of the world. He didn't say to those, he's, he's demanding good works and, and fruits of repentance, and he didn't say, and by the way, if you do those things, it'll take away your sin. He told the soldier, be content with his wages. He told this person, start doing that. That person, stop doing that. Straighten up this and straighten up that, and come down here and get baptized. And when he'd done all that, he said, and behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. John never suggested Baptism would save you, repentance would save you, good works would save you, preparing a way for Messiah would save you. Now I know, I know, I've got all kinds of books and so do you. Well, you know, back up in well, John's time, people got saved by, why would, you, why would you send emails and phone calls and text messages saying, well, you know, John taught salvation by works. Where? Show me the verse. Where John said, this baptism will save you. John said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John said. And Jesus said, you don't, you don't believe me? Believe John. He told you how to get saved. Keep going, keep going. Verse 36. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me, and the Father, Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Now, these two witnesses, one of them are Jesus' works, and one of them is what the Father said about Jesus. Now, let me ask you something. If Jesus Christ came into Galilee, Nazareth, Judea, Jerusalem, and gave sight to the blind, how would that prove he was the Messiah if you hadn't read the prophecies that said the Messiah would give sight to the blind? If he cleansed lepers, if he raised the dead, if he, if he healed the sick, if all of these things if you hadn't read in the Psalms and in the prophets that when Messiah comes, he would do these things, the working of those miracles would not convince you that he was the Savior. So even in the time when Christ walked the earth, there was a requirement that you believe the Old Testament scriptures in order to believe the works you were seeing. Make sense? The Father, the Father has borne witness of me. In what way? So when he spoke on the Mount of Transfiguration, there's three people there. 
So in his baptism, who heard that? There's the Jordan River is rushing. He's out in the in the river. He's not standing on the shore getting a cup of a Dixie cup of water on his forehead. He's down in the water. He's coming up out of the water. How would the Father have spoken to the entire nation and told them this is the Savior? It would have had to have been the 39 books he gave them. And you know what? Just to make sure they didn't miss it, when he finished Malachi, he didn't say anything else to that nation for 400 years. Between Malachi and John the Baptist is 400 years. Don't you think in four centuries you should have found out what to be looking for in a Savior when he came? It's not like, okay, here, here, here's 39 books. You're going to have a test in four weeks. You better know it. No, 400 years to find out about a birth in Bethlehem, shepherds, manger, wise men, Herod killing babies. 400 years you couldn't find that? You're upset about a virgin birth? You had that prophecy for 700 years. How'd you miss it? Because just like people today, well, I believe in God, but they never look at what he said. And so they missed him. They got three witnesses. Well, four. Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus works, God the Father. They missed them all. Then he says this, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them... Ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Now, why wouldn't they come to Jesus to get life? Because they hadn't searched the scriptures. Now, this shouldn't be controversial. What he's saying is before Calvary, this shouldn't be controversial. You know what he said? If you read the scriptures or had the scriptures, you could possibly think salvation came by animal sacrifices, Sabbath keeping, or good works. But if you would search the scriptures, you'd come to me for life. Now, what can Jesus be saying other than the scriptures teach I'm the life. And if you didn't see that, it's because you listen to Pharisees or Sadducees or scribes or fundamentalist pastors and you didn't search the scriptures. So I just think before Calvary, people were saved by keeping the law. Okay. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and read the roll call of faith, half the people in it lived and died before the law. Now what are you going to do? After God gave the law, there's people in there that are Gentiles, one of them a prostitute. I doubt Rahab was keeping the law. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's great to have a Bible. It's better to read it. It's even better to search it. And yes, and, and believe what you read. All right, so salvation. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. I think we looked at that one Sunday night. Okay, then don't turn. You can just quote it. You, we've already looked at it. You, you know it. Brother David got up here and said, Who would have thought you could memorize the whole chapter of Philippians? Not me. <laughs> well, I take it back. I thought I would. <laughs> it's, it's having a hard time staying in there. It wants to leave and go somewhere else. All right, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child, from a child, 
Thou hast known the holy scriptures. When Timothy's a child, the holy scriptures consist of the Old Testament. Yeah. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through Sabbath keeping, through animal sacrifices, through being a Jew, through proselyting to Israel. Well, we just go by Paul. Okay, let's go by Paul. Paul said, the scriptures Timothy had taught him that salvation was through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what they taught us. Well, I don't see that. Then go search the scriptures. Adam didn't get out of that garden alive by works. Abel wasn't accepted by God through the life that he lived. Adam was covered, covered by God when he received from God a covering after the shedding of blood. Yeah. Abel was accepted in the eyes of God because his sacrifice was the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Children of Israel didn't do enough good works to get them two meters out of Egypt in 430 years. And the blood of a Lamb got them all out in one night. Isaac and Abraham go up on a mountain. I see, I see the wood. I see the knife. I see the fire. Where's the, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? So we can't worship God without a lamb. And Abraham said, God shall provide himself, himself, a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, I, I was thinking what I said Sunday night. I'm not saying everybody saw that back in the Old Testament times, but most people don't see it in the New Testament times. Jesus said, uh, don't lose your place in 2 Timothy there. I'll read you something Jesus said. Maybe, you, maybe this sounds familiar to you. For God so loved the world, how many of you learned this when you were a little boy, a little girl? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We quote that verse like the first word isn't on the, in the verse. For God so loved the world. For is a connecting word. Verse 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. So what do you have? You have the fulfillment, John 3, 16, of the picture promise, John 3, 14 and 15. I'm not telling you when those people left that day, having, having lived because they looked at the serpent on the pole, they said, well, you know what that is? That's a type of Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you that. But I'm telling you, if you read that and you can't see Jesus Christ, you're not seeing what he told you to see. And if you want to understand Calvary or make Calvary understandable to a child, you can tell them the story of the people being bitten by serpents. You say, oh, they must have been horrible sinners. Oh, they were. They were complaining. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done anything all that bad. Have you ever complained? <laughs> They're being bitten with serpents and dying because of things I was saying today in turbulence. <laughs> and you know what they had to do? not clean up their life, not straighten up, not do better, not make up for the past sins. They had to look by faith and live. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And they looked and they lived after the giving of the law. That's Numbers 21. The law is given in Exodus chapter 20. You know how they get saved after the giving of the law? They looked and they lived. Where are you 
good at that? Reading the Old Testament and searching the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. It's a big book. And the more you read it, two things will happen. It will get smaller and it will get bigger. It will. You'll understand it better and better and better and better. And you know there's more and more and more and more you don't understand. Because this book's alive. It's written by an eternal God. You think you're going to figure it out in 20 years? Oh, I read the Bible. Really? How many times? Oh, three times. The eternal God wrote a book that'll last forever, and you read it three times, and you're done? Really? Some of you watched your favorite movie more than that. First Corinthians 15, verse number one, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein you stand. We read this the other night. Verse three, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. It's, it's, so, it's so plain to me. I don't know why it's not so plain to the brethren that give me so much grief. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scriptures? That would have to be the Old Testament scriptures. Do you believe Christ was, was pierced on the cross? That's not in the New Testament. You believe his visage was marred on the cross? That's not in the New Testament. You be, believe his back was plowed like a field? That's not in the New Testament. The sufferings of Christ at Calvary are not told in the Gospels. They're told in the Law and in the Prophets. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So here's what Paul said I preached. Now, now let, let's, be, let's be Paul only. And, and let's pretend, just for a minute, just for the sake of, just to have some fun, let's pretend that the, the gospel for the Christian church starts with Paul. Paul said he got it from the Old Testament scriptures. And that what he preached was in accord with the Old Testament scriptures. And for Paul to get saved, he had to receive the gospel that he preached. He said, I want you to receive this. I also received this. How could he receive something that didn't exist? That's a strange thing. Verse number 5, he's seen of Cephas, then 12. After that, he's seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain of this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Then of all the apostles. James and all the apostles. Everybody see that? James, all the apostles. Last of all, he's seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am least of the apostles. There they are again. And not meet to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God, which started after I got saved. Well, that doesn't work. Verse 10 but by the grace of God, I am what I am, for his grace was, which was put upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, who's they? You've had three references to the other apostles, so we preach, and so ye believe then whatever Paul preached, the other 12 were preaching it too. So where do you get that from? Just reading all the Bible instead of a few verses taken out of it and putting a pamphlet. So salvation's there. The personal work and work of Christ is there. One more this evening. There's so many places we could turn. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's a Pauline epistle written in the New Testament church. It's present truth of the one body regarding the mystery. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would, I would not that ye should be ignorant 
how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The only way I could obey Paul and not be ignorant of what I just read is to go read Exodus. I can't, just, I can't just study what Paul wrote or I'll never understand what Paul wrote. Verse 3, And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them, and that rock, capital R, was Christ. Okay, so, so here's, here, look, watch, watch how they work together. I'm told in the New Testament... The children of Israel in the wilderness didn't just get physical refreshment, they got spiritual refreshment. I'm told in the Old Testament that a rock followed them and water came out of that rock. I'm told in the New Testament that the power, the water-giving, life-sustaining power was Christ. And there's a rock lowercase r, a real rock following them around. That's pretty cool. And a real Christ, uppercase rock, following them around. That's pretty cool. And the only way I can know the whole truth of the matter is to study both testaments. I get the event in the old. I get the details in the new. Then I go back and I get the understanding of the old and the prophecy of the old. Then I come back and I, you, see, you see how it works? Amen. One builds upon the other, builds upon the other, builds upon the other. And the more you look at it, the better it gets. Oh, but we're not finished. Uh. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Verse number five. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were. You like grammar? I know some of you, some of you hate grammar. You like grammar? Okay, even if you don't like grammar. Look at what you just read. Now, now, these things were. That's bizarre. How can you have a now that were? How can were be now? Because the everlasting God, the Alpha and the Omega said, watch it, watch it, watch it. There it is back there. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Here is it over here. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Here is it in your life. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Here is it a hundred years from now. The truth just keeps circling and back and circling back and circling back. Say, so there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. And when you overlay all the truths about a topic in the Bible, one on top of the other, then you get the entire truth of what God wants you to have. And it's here a little, and it's there a little, and it's here a little, and it's there a little, and you put it all together, and wow. I never knew all that was in there because it wasn't all there in one spot. You had to search. Now watch this. Now these things were our examples. So people living back in the wilderness in the book of Numbers, boring, and Deuteronomy, more boring, are examples of our churches. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be idolaters, as were some of them. Well, oh, I would never, I would never set up an idol in my in my home. I'm not an idolater. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink. <laughs> you know what God just said, your plate's an idol. And rose up to play. Your video games and your ball games and the games you're watching on, they're an idol. If they're more beloved than Jesus Christ, it's idolatry. If they occupy more time and, and, and uh, 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 get more of our uh, money and our devotion, 
They're an idol. Lord said, I'm telling, I'm telling my New Testament church to learn from Old Testament Israel not to be idolaters. Verse number eight, neither, neither let us commit fornication. Oh, a Christian would never do that, as some of them committed. And fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Well, you talk about COVID. You talk about a pandemic. What if God started killing fornicators? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Uh, we got people dying all over America, and uh, we can't figure out what's the matter. And then some preacher comes along and says, I know what's the matter. They're in bed together and they're not married. Oh, well, you know, get rid of this guy. He's some kind of crazy fanatic. And they just keep dropping dead all over the place. That's what happened. 23,000 people dead. Now, you know why you got to read the whole Bible? Because some, some wise guy, some wise guy went back into Numbers and he said, Well, Numbers said that 24,000 died and 1 Corinthians said 23,000 died. See, there's a contradiction in the Bible. So you hear that, and you say, well, let's find out. And you go back and read numbers, and guess what? A thousand lingered until the next day and then died. Wow. Corinthians says 23,000 died in one day. Numbers said 24,000 died in the entire plague. There's no contradiction in the Bible. You just didn't search the scriptures. You read something in a book. Study the Bible. Amen. I've written books. I've written plenty of books. Lord lets me live longer. I hope to write some more. You know what I do? I handle people. I say, read this. Check it by the Bible. If there's something in it that doesn't match the Bible, let me know. We'll rewrite it. We'll revise it. We'll change it. I don't want anything in that book that doesn't match the Bible. But don't read the book and not check the Bible. If the Bible says one thing, somebody's book says another, throw it out. They, they all fell off. They, 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 over the years, they dry rotted and fell off. My, the library back there, I used to have these, these poison stickers on about three-fourths of the book in my library. So you would know it's in there because there's some good stuff in there, but there's some arsenic in there. There's some, some strychnine in there. Some Corona-20 in there. <laughs> COVID-23 or whatever. And... I got a lot of people saying, you like me? I can't believe you recommend that author. I don't recommend any authors anymore, uh, hardly ever, because somebody said, well, you know, he said something that's not true. Everybody says something's not true, but God, God's the only person that ever, ever wrote a book and everything in it was just absolutely right. Anyway, I got I to gotta get through this. Verse number nine, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted so I thought they were tempting God. Well, who do you think he is? The Old Testament says they tempted God. The New Testament said they tempted Christ. That's a pretty good argument. Christ is God. And were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. As some of them also murmured. And were destroyed of the destroyer. That one I'm still searching the destroyer. I'm not exactly sure who, who that is. I hope I never meet him. I hope one day I get to heaven and God says, you know that destroyer, let me tell you who he was. And, and I can say, never knew. I wish I knew everything in the Bible. I don't want to know the identity and the power and the fierceness of the destroyer. Just just leave that alone. People read back there in Revelation. So this, this Apollyon, who do you think Apollyon is? A bad guy. <laughs> that's enough. That's, that's all I want to know, all I need to know. Plan on be at the judgment seat of Christ when he shows up. Okay, so you ready? We just read all that. Verse 11. Now, now, all these things happened unto them for ensamples. And they are written for our 
admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now watch what the Holy Spirit did. We're, we're almost done. Stay with me. Watch what the Holy Spirit did. He said, Paul, I want you in the strongest possible terms to tell them just because they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb doesn't mean they can't make a mess and a total ruin of their lives. I want you to tell them that in the strongest possible terms. Here's the quickest way to do it. Tell them to go back and read what happened to the children of Israel. Why write four new chapters in the New Testament when you've got the necessary material in the Old Testament and you can just tell people to go back there and read it? See how it works? Why, what's wrong with sinning after you get saved? Aren't we under grace? Aren't we free to do whatever we want? Don't judge me. The Holy Spirit said to the Apostle Paul, tell them to go back and read it. All right, just so I don't leave you hanging, because I, I know you grammarians picked up on this. Verse 6, these things were our examples. These things, each individual one, example. Collectively, collectively, verse 11, now all these things, see the all? All these things happen to them for in samples. I'm going to help you. You don't, need a, you don't need a new Bible. You just... Need some quick, easy lessons. It's real easy. You know what, you know what an ensample is? It's the plural form of example. An individual event person is an example. A group of people or a group of events is an ensample. I didn't know that. I'm doing that by definition book. An ensample. I wonder what ensample is. That ends a prefix. And it's a prefix signifying plurality. Now, see how easy that was? Saved you $55, $60 on a, on a new Bible. And you hear that, you know it, you never forget it. Next time you read Ensample, oh, I learned that. I learned that church one Thursday night. Ensample, I don't know what that is. That's plural, 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 plurality. I'm trying. Plurality of examples is an ensample. Pretty good. What size sample you got? You want an X or you want an N? <laughs> I'll take an X, okay? Here's an example. <laughs> I'm kind of a slow learner. Give me an N. Okay, here's an N sample. See, single sample, larger sample. Amen. Thank the Lord. All right, so... In conclusion, God gave you 66 books. 39 of them make up the New Testament. A smaller collection of them are written specifically to and for the New Testament church. But the understanding of those Books written specifically for and to and for the New Testament church require the study and understanding of all the rest of the books in order to understand the ones written specifically to and for the church. So Ephesians is not written to Jews. It's not written to unsaved Gentiles. It's written to the church. But to understand Ephesians... Chapter 2, the Jew and Gentile in one body. What's a Jew? What's a Gentile? What's circumcision? What's a... So, so you, have to, you have to study the whole Bible to properly understand the parts that are for you, which means that every part is for you. Fair enough? All right. Two people. <laughs> Fair enough? Uh. All right. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the Bible. Help us, God, to search it, study it, love it, meditate upon it, grasp it a little more each day. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name and amen.